Welcome, old friends and new, to another episode of Bring Your Own Grief. I am, as always, your humbled host, R. Glenn Kelly, and this is a special installment of the BYOG Network, because today's episode is not actually focused on my fellow grievers out there. Not directly, anyway. Instead, this episode is, is for my former fellow business leaders, owners, executives, senior and frontline managers, HR personnel, actually any and all of those who have a responsibility of sound stewardship in their enterprises. And let me ask them a question directly. Are you aware that businesses and organizations across America are losing an astounding $100 billion in annual revenue to an ignored issue? That's annual loss, by the way, each year. Yeah, $100 billion comes straight out of the bottom line across America each and every year, all directly due to the impacts of grieving employees in the workplace. Were you aware of that? That's a whole lot of money to lose for something so easy to mitigate. And every organization shares in that hidden but recoverable cost. Grief and bereavement impacts us all. For-profit companies, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and even civic groups. So whether you're leading a small to mid-sized business, a Fortune 500 enterprise, or you're responsible for the sound practices of tax dollars, donor funds, or membership dues, you don't want to miss this episode. Grief in the Workplace, Mitigating the Hidden Cost of Employee Bereavement. And hey, if you are a grieving employee who happened upon this episode, please feel free to stick around. If you've followed me and our BYOG network in the past, you know that I too am a grieving father. I'm also someone who believes that awareness and understanding are the key to helping us move a little farther down the path of hope and healing. So stick by and learn about the impacts of our losses to the workplace. It'll serve you well to get that awareness and understanding of how our loss affects business across the country. For just a moment though, I want to take the time to thank you all for tuning in to the Bring Your Own Grief Network. I am honored. If you haven't yet, please make sure you subscribe to the BYOG YouTube channel. And if you find value in this episode or others, like it on YouTube and share it with others. Whether you're a business leader or griever, Please know that subscribing, liking, and sharing these episodes will help other grievers more easily find this and other resources from our network. Help promote healing, please. So thank you and welcome to all. If you haven't listened to me in the past at conferences, podcasts, webinars, or video episodes, know that I have experienced grief from both sides of the fence as a business executive and as a bereaved father. Now, as for the business side, after what most would have considered a full adult life, beginning with an honorable tour in the United States Marine Corps, followed by local and federal law enforcement agencies, I spent another decade and a half in executive positions within the defense industry with some of the largest government contractors around the globe. So I don't just speak solely from study and stats. I speak from the heart as well, from professional and yes, painful experiences. As for my loss, the story of my 16-year-old son, John, and he's my only child. He passed away from a rare heart defect. I've covered that in so many other media areas, my, my books, my website, and other productions. But I hope you get to know John and me. I remain the proud father of Jonathan Taylor Kelly, who, who left an amazing legacy behind here on earth for his father to live out. Now, all that said, I'm going to give you a scenario, leaders, a question actually. And I do hope you know the answer. Here it is. You have an upcoming meeting with your board of directors right around the corner. One topic you're expected to address is a recent discovery that businesses across America, including yours, are collectively losing over $100 billion in annual revenue due to a once hidden but now recognized cost. Would you proudly report to the board that your plan to mitigate, to, to reduce the company's share of this loss rests only upon a program performed solely by a fourth party provider. 
with limited or even no accountability and with historically low participation by your employees? Could you confidently tell the board that this program is the best you can do for employee welfare and safety, as well as company reputation and overall productivity? Heck of a question, right? Personally, I would expect a resignation letter along with that, wouldn't you? Now, if you didn't pick up on it there, there's a little dig in that question which hints of using an employee assistance program. I'll talk about EAPs in some length towards the end of this episode, but for now, just know I'm actually a very strong advocate of EAPs and, and how they can serve the bereaved. It might not seem so in the way I backhandedly spoke of them just now, but stick with me for a bit and I'll fill you in. Listen, I want to put something else to bed right off the bat here too. The impacts of grief in a workplace are not so much about an employee passing away. So I don't want you to shy away from this early because you believe it doesn't apply to your organization. That happens a lot when we bring up grief in a workplace. Our minds go right to the death of a coworker, someone we work with. We don't believe we deal with that very often on the job, do we? It just doesn't happen a great deal. Maybe not. Not losing a direct employee anyway. The CDC, the, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, actually reports an average of 823 deaths per 100,000 persons in the United States each year. So that breaks down to a tad less than one death for every 100 persons annually. One for every 100 across the country in a year. It sounds small, huh? The vast majority of businesses in America are made up of small and mid-sized companies, right? So death just doesn't seem to rear its ugly head that often for businesses with 10, 25, or 50 employees, does it? Now, don't get me wrong here. I think we've all lost co-workers if, if we've been around long enough, regardless of company size. And the tragic loss of any employee, regardless of company size, will have negative financial and production issues tied to it in every organization. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics just released figures from 2016, their, their latest released, which shows that the number of deaths on the job was 4,836 employees for that year, 2016. But this is one, something we don't really want to think about, agreed? But when one employee passes away, a strong business can identify the gaps and the means to fill those gaps quickly. Yeah, certainly there, there's negative impacts to productivity and some of it emotional too, which can actually carry on in the workforce for some time into the future. However, in what can be a relatively short time again, operations are soon back to accepted standards. To that point, what I'm speaking of here in this episode is the death of an employee's loved one, immediate family members, not just a single employee on the job. And if we look at the recent CDC and Department of Labor estimates, each employee in America has an average of 3.4 immediate family members at home. Well, let's add to that the possibility of two living parents and, and maybe a sibling or two. So the potential of grief impacting the workplace grows exponentially, with each employee representing 3.4 or more other possibilities of grief risk to the operations. Small and mid-sized businesses may not be so small anymore, right? Currently, more stats, the American Hospice Foundation estimates over 4 million employees in the American workforce experience a death of a close loved one each and every year. 4 million employees each year have someone close to them die. It's a pretty big number of grieved employees, something we truly ignore at our own peril. Anyway, one more set of stats. This one an area that I can relate to because I went through child loss. The U.S. Department of Labor reports the prime age of productivity for employees is 35 years of age. Prime age, 35. That, that golden time of one's life and career when, on average, his or her talents, work experience, and motivations are at their peak. Well, unfortunately, the CDC also has a stat, a stat which reveals the average age for parents who might lose a child. And that age is also what? Yep, 35. On average, we are hit right in our prime with life altering loss. And grief healing from loss has no real predictable timetable. It's unique and individual to each employee who has experienced loss. 
Was it, heaven forbid, a child, a spouse, a parent, a sibling? There are so many variables in relationship dynamics, each of which can influence a level of emotions, as well as the length of time spent in the more profound levels of grief. Or more to our point here, the length of time the influences of acute grieving can sway the safe and efficient performance of the bereaved employee. Now, it'll help a great deal here if I stop and tell you where the $100 billion in lost annual revenue figure comes from, right? So in the year 2003, a U.S.-based foundation known as the Grief Recovery Institute of Sherman Oaks, California, released the results of an extensive study published under the title, The Grief Index, The Hidden Annual Costs of Grief in the America Workplace. In the study, they originally estimated the cost of grief to American businesses at $75.1 billion each year. Now, founded in 1987, the Institute had over 500,000 grievers who had participated in their renowned grief recovery outreach program, of which 25,000 were actively employed at the time they experienced the death of a loved one. These bereaved employees were directly interviewed as to how their loss affected job performance. When the resulting study was published, the Wall Street Journal immediately and thoroughly investigated the findings with great interest and published their own paper reporting they found the Grief Recovery Institute study was, quote, significant because of its use of as many quantitative measures as possible. The journal went on to say GRI counselors interviewed more than 25,000 employed participants and used 12 recognized and established productivity studies to conservatively factor the cost of a grieving employee's lost hour. Now, that accepted study was done in 2003. <laughs> and no offense to any business or anyone, but I can tell you nothing has really changed with grief support in the workplace since that time. Well, nothing except inflation, right? We all know about inflation. With inflation estimated to be an average of 2.05% per year since 2003, $75.1 billion becomes $100 billion today. Okay, actually, if I took the figure on this date of the video, it would only be $98.1 billion. <laughs> if I wanted to be factual. But... Let me proffer this to you. Along with inflation, the grief index didn't address the tremendous cost of substance abuse in the workplace. The US CDC reports that alcoholism alone costs US organizations a whopping $249 billion each and every year. Now, illicit drug use, on the other hand, is yet another, another staggering $193 billion. Would it surprise you to know that the CDC also reports a vast majority of relapses into substance abuse are a direct result of the death of a loved one? So, given that the Wall Street Journal found that the grief index study conservative or intentionally low on the side, we can certainly consider bringing some of the substance abuse cost over. Heck, even a fraction of $442 billion from alcohol and drug use and we are safely over the $100 billion mark. Agreed? Sadly? Oh, and I didn't even ask you to factor in the CDC estimated 100,000 women who experience miscarriages every year in the United States, or the other 26,000 who experience stillbirths. I'm sure a portion of those women were actively employed in and around the time of their unfortunate grief event. Now, not putting the impacts of those losses aside, you can still agree $100 billion or $98.1 billion on its face is a huge loss to revenue. An unthinkable amount for something that honestly costs little to nothing for a wise organization to recognize, to act on, and to alleviate. There's nothing really to buy or maintain or update, but, but more on that later. Where does the loss come from specifically? If you haven't experienced it yourself, and I hope you do not, grief has a caustic, painful emotion set to it. It, it, it. The profound loss can be incredibly taxing. While the more acute mental and physical challenges may be more prevalent early after a loss, 
it can actually continue at some effective levels for months, years, and even decades for the employee, both off and on the job. The greatest help they can receive is an environment where they can process their loss and the emotions in healthy ways. And guess what? You know as well as I do that most of us spend more awake time with those at work than we do with those at home. Therefore, the workplace and how the griever is managed has a huge influence on his or her healing processes. And let me tell you, loss of a loved one can bring on confusion, anger, fear, incredible anxiety, and so much more. The physical impacts alone can be overwhelming to many. Let me tell you about some, but not all, of, of, of how that hits us. Your grieving employee returning to work after a loss might be experiencing such physical challenges as insomnia, loss of appetite, restlessness, fatigue, muscle weakness, body aches and pains, headaches and migraines, heart palpitations, tightness in the chest, shortness of breath, gastric or stomach pains, increased severity to current health problems, decreased immunity, which means more frequent illnesses. Can you imagine the toll this takes on just the body alone? <laughs> and the griever may have some, all, or a combination of any of these, or even physical impacts I didn't, I didn't even mention. And what about the mind, you ask? The psychological impacts, the mental and emotional state for the newly bereaved? <laughs> the, the bad stuff is probably just kicking in and, and rattling around their brains when they're just getting back to work. Many of us had too much to do right after the loss to even stop and, and think about our emotions. Now, like the others, these following mental impacts can exist in combinations too and come and go as they please. They include, but are certainly not limited to, lack of concentration, confusion, memory loss, anxiousness, distractedness, mental exhaustion, lethargy or, or being lethargic, prolonged anger, other mood extremes, denials of reality, distrust of self and others, withdrawal, loss of faith, and, and depression. <laughs> I'll absolutely admit to a number of these after my loss, some that still pop up from time to time today. But I want you to expressly be aware that many grievers will try to hide these feelings or moods from you and other coworkers. They need their jobs. They're concerned how you'll perceive their value. And thankfully, you know what an asset they are, right? But the next question is, how does all that transfer to the workplace, to productivity, the lost hidden cost to the bottom line? Now, in no particular order, let's, let's talk about that now. First, you may very well see increased absenteeism, which already costs our businesses 225 billion dollars each year per our Department of Labor. And then there's increased accidents and injuries on the job. Listen to this. On Memorial Day in 2012, then U.S. Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis stated in a speech, every year in America nearly four million people suffer a workplace injury from which some never recover. Every day in America 13, 13 people go to work and never come home. Now that deeply sets safety in our minds, am I right? As a matter of fact, part of that release study from the Grief Recovery Institute found that 90% of frontline employees who experienced the death of a loved one reported increased injuries on the job, which they directly related to their grief. Hmm. Then there's errors in judgment. That same study also showed that 85% of those employed in management positions from executives to frontline supervisors reported experiencing major errors in judgment on the job that continued on for at least six months beyond the grief event. But let's also add to that higher general liability costs for you, higher workers' comp rates, higher turnover rates, increased hiring costs, increased training costs, errors in tasks, incomplete assignments, delayed production, higher oversight costs, absent-mindedness, apathy to responsibilities and goals, insubordination towards supervisors, alcohol and substance abuse, decreased workforce morale, disruption, 
to clients, partners, and suppliers. Had enough? Grief in the workplace obviously has a huge, huge impact. Look, good organizations usually recognize and mitigate loss to revenue and productivity in short order. It's what makes many successful businesses well, successful. However, and I'm just being honest, grief is an issue still not handled very well, if at all, in corporate America or in local, state, or fed government agencies for that matter. It's almost understandable though. After all, grief is a, it's a tough subject. Mortality is something we don't easily think about. And that's exactly why it remains a hidden cost for most. One not approached often because it makes us feel, well, uncomfortable. Now, don't get me wrong here. That doesn't mean that companies are dispassionate about grief. Everyone I've ever worked with or worked for has been thoughtful and caring when someone returned to work after a loss. But the death of a loved one is a personal issue and we aren't conditioned well as leaders to involve the business in the employee's personal affairs. When you come to work, leave your home life at the door, right? Well, that works both ways. Deep inside as a personnel manager, I would hope they always leave home at home. After all, a business is in the business of what? Being in business, not tending to emotional needs and concerns off, off the job, right? I don't have time to deal with the personal lives of my staff. I have to get things done. And that's where the EAPs come into play, right? If you are a good company, you'll provide the services of EAP and, well, you've done your part, right? Now, you know up front, once again, I believe in and appreciate the services of EAPs. I'm not trying to dismiss them at all here. They can be a phenomenal service and I applaud any business that contracts one. Actually, the Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM, reports that currently in the U.S., over 97% of companies with more than 5,000 employees contract out to an EAP. Another 80% of organizations with 1,000 to 5,000 employees use them, as well as 75% of businesses with 250 to 1,000 employees. That's incredible. Thank you. However, when it comes to the bereaved employee, Many leaders honestly believe their EAPs are the end-all and do-all for emotional support. I know it sounds sarcastic, but the mindset becomes, well, you know, Johnny had a loss in the family and I understand he's hurting. Let's make sure he knows we have an EAP and we've done our job. We care. He'll get what he needs and be back at work and back up to speed in no time. As a matter of fact, one of my grief support services I provide is conducting leadership workshops and training to organizations, specifically on how to handle the bereaved on their return to work and to reduce the cost of grief to the bottom line. It's called the Workforce Capital Recovery Program, and you can find out more about it on my website, rglenkelly.com. But I'll let you know now, it can be a little frustrating to meet with business leaders and tell them what I do, ask them if I can help with their lost revenue from grief. I usually get stopped mid-sentence just to hear them say, that's okay, we're, we're already helping our bereaved employees. We have a wonderful EAP service. Now, first, I have to explain to them that, that the coaching I provide is not for the bereaved employee. It's designed for and provided to the business and, and, and the business leaders and frontline managers in the organization. It is the blueprint for care and feeding of the grieving employee by their leaders and it covers far more than just grief from the death of a loved one. It's also highly relevant to other grief events, such as an employee going through an unwanted divorce, a, a major change to personal health, or, or the personal health of a loved one. It may be grief due to just becoming an empty nester with the, the last kid off to college. There are just a number of personal issues off the job that could impact one on the job, impacting motivation, performance, and therefore productivity. Next, I have to talk to these leaders about why the EAP is not all that can be and should be done for the grieved employee. Let me peel back the reasons here why it's not. First, and simply most effectively said, an employee grieving from the profound loss of a spouse, a child, or immediate family member is not going to just get over it. Parts of that loss will be with the griever throughout life, and part of that ongoing life will be on the job with you. And just as EAPs have wonderful pros, they also have their cons. What can those be? Right up front is a biggie to me. EAP providers are, in fact, third-party 
outside vendors whom we contract out to, who then contract out our needs to their own outside contractors for our mental health services. That means that the needs of the employee and really the organization are actually being outsourced to fourth party providers. This on its own seems shaky to me as a previous business exec. There are far too many layers of disconnect between the troubled employee, the organization, the EAP, and that fourth party provider helping my guy or girl, my employee. These multiple layers have been identified as, as one reason why EAP use is so low across the country too. According to Sherm, and get this, only 3% to 7% of eligible employees currently take advantage of EAPs when offered. Only 3 to 7%. That's it. Where's the value, the, the return to the company? And regardless, another reason this could be so low is the negative stigma of EAPs by employees who believe that any involvement with mental health professionals will blacklist them for the rest of their careers. EAPs, so they believe, are are for those found with drug or alcohol problems at work and order to go for help or be fired. It's a shame. If a company wants any value from the EAP, better communications with the staff is a must, huh? But, but that's for another episode. So another point, and contrary to popular belief, EAPs are not necessarily free to the employee, nor are they always inexpensive for the company either. See, originally, these programs performed employee services in person, by telephone, and even over the internet through licensed counselors. Up to six sessions were generally offered free of charge to the employee. But that changed somewhat after the financial crisis in our country in 2008. We all remember that. Many providers retailed their services a bit to compensate. Currently, the free to the employee EAPs operate on an assess and refer model. Employees call the EAP phone number and are referred to a fourth party treatment provider, again, outside of the EAP. And this can now trigger a claim on the employer's health care plan. Plans, they vary greatly, so this is not the case in all providers, but in the majority. Regardless, given the rising cost of health care these days, the last thing either the employer or the employee wants are health insurance claims. And if your business is experience rated, meaning your insurance carrier annually reviews your health care costs, then what happens? Right? Your premiums go up. If the program is merely directing more traffic to the health care plan, then it's costing the company and the employees more in the long term. It's not good. Yet another issue that concerns me is the accountability and control. See, under state and federal law, with few exceptions, confidentiality exists between the mental health professional and the employee. Without express consent by that employee, the company holds no real accountability for the effectiveness of an outsourced program. And it doesn't seem like good stewardship to blindly spend company funds on something we won't know is helping or not. And there's no way around that. I, too, respect and understand confidentially, so it is what it is, it's still. So let's stop and recap for a second, see what we've got here with EAPs. We are contracting out the needs of our troubled employees, the, the company's greatest assets, to a third-party provider who then farms that out to yet a fourth-party provider. We are paying for a service that has historically low participation rate by employees. With, with zero or very limited accountability in company dollars spent. We are offering a mental health service to grieving employees, which if actually used has limited free visits or even possibly no free visits. It may result in taking money out of the employee's pocket and, and yes, possibly jack up the annual insurance cost to the company. Seems like that's not really the end all and do all anymore, is it? So as you can imagine, when I hear a business leader say, we don't need additional help. We have an EAP. You forgive me if I don't completely agree. Again, I think EAPs are wonderful programs that do good for so many. The concept actually came around back in the 1940s, post-World War II, to help the huge, huge increase in job site issues with alcoholism and the veterans returning to work after the war. Then EAPs blossomed through the 1970s into the 80s, 90s, and today, but then again took a little bump 
during the financial crisis of 2008. So here yet is another very important issue that I feel. Even if the grieving employee finds help in an EAP provided counselor, it's probably going to be only weekly at best, probably not daily anyway. And again, sessions may be limited if free and, and costly if not. Still, it will be support on someone else's schedule, not the bereaved schedule, someone else's schedule. <laughs> but where does an employee go every day? Right, an employee goes to work at least five days a week for most employees. They are, they're on the job, they need the money. We actually spend more awake time, remember, on average with coworkers on the job than we do with those at home. Will the grieving employee be ready for work when he or she comes back? Very doubtful. Part of that has to do with bereavement leave. The national average, after all, for paid bereavement leave is only three days. Now, some organizations do give more, some less, some give none at all, but three is the average. It's just, it's odd really under the FMLA or the Family Medical Leave Act, a, a working mother-to-be can take lots of time off leading up to and after the birth of a child and, and should, it's, it's much needed. But heaven forbid, if she loses that child later in life, she gets only three days to deal with that. Three days to deal with the death of a child. It, it just makes you wonder, doesn't it? But bottom line, the griever is probably not going to be ready when they must return to work. Will you be? Now, real quick, if, if you really want to get the perspective of the grieving employee and their return to work, I encourage you to take the time to watch my episode 11 here on the BYOG Network, Taking Your Grief to Work. I know you'll find it incredibly helpful to see it from the perspective of the employee. It's available for free, as all my videos are here on the YouTube channel. But getting back to it, you heard me talk earlier about a grief healing process. For those of us who have experienced a traumatic loss of a loved one, we will never heal completely. Know that. It will just be with us until we die as well. But we will return to living a life of purpose. And yes, be productive employees again. We just need to begin healing. Healing in healthy ways. So, the workplace is where the grieved spend a lot of time. Far more than with any mental health professional, right? And they will be hugely impacted by interactions with supervisors, subordinates, and peers daily. Some will be minute by minute, hour by hour. Thankfully, for the company and for the bereaved employee, the workplace is where business leaders can exercise some control over the impacts for those troubled employees. Doing so will result in minimizing revenue from reduced productivity, workplace accidents, and low morale. I encourage you to look harder towards supporting the bereaved and and grieving employees. They have a tremendous influence on the success of your company, organization, or agency. And this support really takes little more to start than just the recognition that grief affects all businesses regardless of size. Then it becomes an expansion of the old cliched paradigm shift, a shift that really has already been taking place in corporate America for years now, that the employee is the greatest asset to the organization. Morale and welfare programs have, have actually grown tremendously in that direction already, right? We've all seen it. Grief, however, seems to have been left behind. As I mentioned earlier, I've seen this from both sides, business leader and grieving father who had to return to work after my loss. But since the time I lost my son, I've left corporate America, and after authoring my very first award-winning book, Sometimes I Cry in the Shower, I've had the privilege of becoming a sought-after keynote speaker and workshop presenter in the grief support community. Along with publishing two other bereavement support books, I have spoken or presented at national and regional conferences over the years with thousands of grievers in attendance, and I've sat down one-on-one -on -one with hundreds to discuss their experiences in returning to work with the grief. This led me to my next book, Grief in the Workplace, Reducing Hidden Revenue Loss from Employee Bereavement. This one is for you, the employer. It's due out shortly and expands on what we have talked about here massively, as well as going more into depth on, on compassionate workplace support. I'll be sure to make announcements here and across social media on the book's public release. And as I mentioned briefly just a moment ago, I also offer business workshops, coaching, and training for managing grief in the workplace. 
My corporate training is called the Workforce Capital Recovery Program, and these half-day or full-day seminars conducted by me at your facility anywhere in America are not meant to be attended by the grieving employee. Instead, attendees should be the organizational leaders and human resource personnel. My coaching provides nothing that requires or takes the place of a licensed mental health professional, nor is it meant to replace an EAP. I provide only proactive, reactive, and initiative-based methodologies in, in managing grieved employees, which comes from not just stats and study, but again, professional and yes, painful personal experience. But once in place, there is no cost to maintain your grief in the workplace program, no software to update, no new hardware to add along the way. The methods and approaches do not expire or become outdated. If used in a manner which promotes change to the culture of your organization successfully, it will reduce your share of $100 billion loss. It can't help but follow. As an added value, the change will also boost industry and community branding for your organization and allow you to confidently say, we are doing everything we can for our greatest assets, our valued employees. Please contact me directly by email or go to my website, arglenkelly.com, to find out more about the Workforce Capital Recovery Program and how it can uncover and return hidden costs to your bottom line. Be that good steward to your organization and your people. All, of course, but especially today, the grieving employer. Thank you for listening, and I wish your company or agency much success. Now, if you'll bear with me through a little housekeeping, I would like to to remind all viewers to watch or listen to my additional videos and podcasts on grief and bereavement support. Again, after the loss of a loved one, awareness and understanding of ourselves and of each other can go a long way to helping with the journey of healing. Also, I'd like to remind you, if you have not, please subscribe to the BYOG YouTube channel and like this video. You may be listening to this as a podcast to such programs as iTunes, iHeart, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. If so, come back and please visit the YouTube channel afterwards and subscribe. Simply search for Arglin Kelly. And just FYI, the more subscribers to our channel and the more likes and shares for our videos there, the easier it becomes for other grievers to find us in a search. For those interested in more information immediately, I highly recommend ordering any of my award-winning grief and bereavement support books. Sometimes I Cry in the Shower, A Grieving Father's Journey to Wholeness and Healing or The Grief Case, A Man's Guide to Healing and Moving Forward in Grief, or Grief Healing 365, 365 Daily Inspirations for Moving Forward to Your New Normal. All are available in paperback and ebook at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, or in paperback at bookstores everywhere. If they don't carry them, kindly ask them to order any or all of the books for you, and tell them to order more for the shelves, please, because, you know, others might be looking to. And if you care to review them first, you'll find book trailers here on the BYOG YouTube channel for each publication and a link there to download chapter one of each book in PDF format for free. If you do, share with me what you think, please. So that's it for now. Thank you for joining me here at the BYOG Network. As always, the place where you can bring your own questions, bring your own pains, bring your own unique emotions, and bring your own grief. I am R. Glenn Kelly. May you find peace and purpose.